Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Hello and welcome to the York Oratory of St. Philip Neri. This is the Oratory Church of St. Wilfrid here in York and my name is Father Daniel Seward. I'm one of the fathers of the Oratory here. Today I'd like to talk to you about St. Joseph, in particularly why St. Joseph is a figure of hope. We call him the hope of the dying in particular. It might seem obvious to us today that St. Joseph is a very important saint, somebody whom a lot of churches are named after. One of the churches we, the fathers here, have care of is St. Joseph's Church in Clifton, a suburb of York. Actually, think about it, not many churches from the Middle Ages are dedicated to St. Joseph. And that's because devotion to St. Joseph only really got started on a big scale from the 16th century onwards. People like St. Teresa of Avila in particular encouraged devotion to St. Joseph. Why was it that St. Joseph was almost invisible for the first 1500 years of Christian history? It's because he is the silent figure in the Gospels. He is the man who steps back, who gives prominence instead, uh, above all, to his foster son, uh, Jesus Christ, and, of course, to uh, our Lord's Blessed Mother, uh, Our Lady. But St. Joseph is somebody whom we need to look at and who, if we can enter into that silence which is his, can give us hope and understanding. So go back to the scriptures and ask, who was St. Joseph? What was his role? Why do we invoke him as patron of the dying? Why does he give us hope? Is he somebody who is important or simply an incidental figure in the Gospels? Firstly, we can see that there are two figures in particular who prefigure St. Joseph in the Old Testament. They are his namesake, Joseph, the son of the patriarch Jacob, and Aaron, the brother of Moses, the uh, Levite, the priest. Joseph, who was the son of Jacob, was the son who was particularly favoured by him, and as a result was hated by his brothers, and uh, when they almost murdered him, instead they sold him into slavery in Egypt. And there, despite the setbacks that he had in his life, he kept rising to the top. He uh, was uh, the steward of Potiphar, and there uh, he was trusted by him with everything, and he set him in charge of all his house. Now that's a, a, a saying that we use in connection with St. Joseph, who was set in charge of the house of God. Of course, Joseph, when he was in the house of Potiphar, encountered a great temptation in the shape of Potiphar's wife. And in that, he exercised the virtue of chastity to an heroic degree, so much so that in fact he was put in prison again and he had to wait there. He had another setback in his life. Nevertheless, that expression, that exercise of chastity, was to be something which was repeated to an even greater degree uh, in uh, Joseph, in Saint Joseph later on in the New Testament. Joseph, uh, the son of Jacob, is somebody also uh, who is given the gift of interpreting dreams. Remember how Saint Joseph is told what to do by the angel in a dream. 
So Joseph dreams about how uh, his brothers will one day bow down before him. And because he is able to interpret the dreams of his fellow prisoners, and later on of Pharaoh, he is set in, in charge of a far greater house. He is set in charge of the house of Pharaoh himself. And there he dispenses grain. He dispenses grain for the whole of Egypt, and in particular to his brothers, the sons of Jacob. Think again of how Saint Joseph is the one who, because he provides a home for Mary and Jesus, gives us, in a certain sense, the bread of life made from grain, who is the one who enables uh, us to live as, he in, as Joseph in the Old Testament enabled his brothers, his people, to live. I also said that Aaron, the brother of Moses, was somebody who prefigures Joseph. Aaron, the priest who has care of the things of the Lord. One day there is a rebellion against him and Moses by uh, Korah. And uh, in order to put down the rebellion, God sends a sign that uh, rods or sticks or branches representing all the different tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, are set before the Lord. And only that belonging to Aaron of the tribe of Levi blooms and produces almonds. In a similar way, there's an apocryphal story about the betrothal of Our Lady and Saint Joseph. We know that Our Lady was dedicated to God in a particular way from the first moment of her conception, but also in her dedication in the temple, um, what we celebrate as the presentation of Mary in the temple. She knew that uh, she was to be consecrated to God uh, for the whole of her life, and she took that promise of perpetual virginity. How to choose somebody then who would be the protector of Our Lady and her consecration to God? In uh, uh, apocryphal stories, Joseph is chosen because he is the one of all her suitors uh, whose branch blooms. And St. Joseph we so often see carrying a lily or carrying a rod, like the rod of Aaron, which was in the tabernacle. And it's symbolic of his special role as the protector of the Holy Family. When Our Lady conceives of the Holy Spirit, Joseph draws back, according to St. Matthew, because he is afraid, because she has conceived what is in her of the Holy Spirit. He has to be reassured by God in a dream that he is to take Mary to his home and that he is to give a name to her child. He is to call him Jesus. That is at the heart of St. Joseph's vocation. That is why St. Joseph is such a figure of hope for us. He comes from a long and distinguished line. He is a member of the house of David. He is a descendant of David who wanted to build a temple for the Lord, but is told that he has shed too much blood, that it is not he who will do this. Instead, your son, will I place upon your throne, and he will have a kingdom which will last forever, he is told. We might think that that son was Solomon. In one sense it was, it was Solomon who built the temple, who in that sense provided a house for God. But far distant down the line is Joseph. Joseph, the son of David, the descendant of that royal line, who nevertheless doesn't live in a palace, who works as a carpenter, and yet he is the one who provides a home for God. He is the one who allows him a place and uh, gives him that lineage of David, thus fulfilling all of the prophecies. It must have seemed to the people of Israel that God was long in keeping his promises, that that hope had been extinguished. Even though the line and dynasty of David was the longest surviving uh, royal house of its time, lasting over 500 years, nevertheless it came to an end when the king of uh, Judah saw um, his sons all executed in front of him and had his eyes put out and was taken into exile. Did God forget about hope at that point? No because there were still descendants, no longer ruling in Jerusalem, no longer kings, but nevertheless for whom God had a plan. And at the end of that long line came Saint Joseph, Joseph the just man, Joseph the man who was chosen to give a name to the Holy Child. 
When in St. Luke's Gospel the angel comes to Mary, she is told, and you shall call him Jesus, a name which means God saves. Joseph is told the same. And remember that in Jewish law, the father of a child was the one who gave him a name. By giving him a name, Joseph takes him into his house and becomes in a real sense his father. Not a biological father, but the father who protects him, who cares for him, who teaches him, and who gives him an inheritance. That inheritance which had been promised from the beginning. That inheritance which a thousand years before had been promised to the house and line of David. And that's why Joseph is the one who takes Mary, his wife, to Bethlehem. And that there, even though they have no place to stay, she gives birth to a son and she lays him in a manger. Eight days later, according to the law of Moses, the child is taken to be circumcised and they give him the name, the holy name of Jesus, which had been given separately to each of them by the angel. Joseph, therefore, is vitally important because he is the one who gives that child a place in Israel, who fulfills the promises. Joseph, as I said before, doesn't say a single word in the scriptures. And yet, there is one word that we do know he said, the holy name of Jesus. And in saying that, he made God accessible to all of us. We cannot know God as he is until he becomes one of us. And he becomes one of us so that we can name him, so that we can lay hold of him, so that we can know him. And all of that is made possible by Our Lady and St. Joseph. Mary gives him a place in her womb. She conceives him in her heart, and then she brings him forth so that all can adore him. Joseph gives him a place in the world. He makes him who he is. And it's St. Joseph warned in a dream not to um, uh, stay in Bethlehem because of the murderous intent of King Herod, who defends and protects and saves the Holy Family by taking them into Egypt. You notice again the connection with his forebear, with, with Joseph in the Old Testament, who also goes into Egypt in order to save his family. Joseph too takes the child Jesus and his mother into Egypt and thereby he continues to live. We might wonder what would have happened if Herod had succeeded in killing the child Jesus at that point rather than those holy innocents, the other uh, baby boys under two of Bethlehem and the area. Of course, that would have been enough to redeem the world. But actually, our Lord came to sanctify everything that is human, to grow up in hiddenness in Nazareth, and so to make holy every aspect of our lives. After Herod has died, Joseph takes Mary and the child back to Nazareth, back where, in a sense, the story began, where the angel first came to Mary uh, and where uh, she conceived of the Holy Spirit. And there in Nazareth, in obscurity, in littleness, in hiddenness, the child grows. He grows in wisdom and in stature and in favour with God and man. And about what else he does, we know very little. And that's quite deliberate. We sometimes call the first 30 years of our Lord's life the hidden life. When he's 30, he's baptized by John the Baptist. He goes out from his mother's house. He preaches, he works miracles, he calls his disciples. But that's just three years of his life. What does he do for 10 times more than that, the first 30 years of his life? The answer is that he lives, like you and like me, he lives an ordinary life. He grows up, he learns, he learns how to pray, and we have just that little glimpse of him when he's 12 years old, when Our Lady and St. Joseph go up as they go up every year. It shows us how obedient they are to the law. They go up to Jerusalem for the Passover, and they take the child Jesus with him, who is now 12, and of course, we know the story how Our Lady thought he was with the men, St. Joseph thought he was with the women, and he's left behind in the temple in that mysterious passage where they find him after three days. 
sitting among the doctors, amazing them with his questions, showing forth his wisdom beyond his years. Did you not know I would be in my father's house, he says. But we know that also that after that incident, he went back to Nazareth and that there he was obedient to his parents, that he lived under their authority. How extraordinary that the incarnate Son of God, the one who created the whole universe, should be obedient to two of his own creatures, to Mary and to Joseph. We know that Our Lady, the Immaculate Mother of God, must have passed on to her son so much. But we also know that St. Joseph must have had a vital role in his upbringing, that we assume that it was he who first taught him his trade. And uh, that trade of being a carpenter, uh, if we like, sanctifies human work. God is the creator of the universe. He made everything that is. And yet the incarnate Son of God, the one who set the stars in place, became subject to Mary and Joseph and learnt how to create from one of his own cre creatures. That was St. Joseph in his carpenter's shop in Nazareth who taught uh, his foster son how to uh, be a carpenter, how to make things with his hands. In doing so, he sanctifies work. He makes work which for Adam and Eve was a curse, and yet has now become a blessing for us, something in which we can participate in God's own love for us. It's a beautiful thought that those things which our Lord learnt in the carpenter's shop in Nazareth later um, fed into what he taught his listeners, what he shared with his disciples. For example, when he says, Come to me, all you who labour and are overburdened, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. A yoke is something that we use to harness animals. You want, if you're ploughing a field with horses or oxen, for the yoke to be easy, not to chafe, not to uh, rub against them. And when Jesus is talking of the care that a carpenter would use in making that yoke so that people would want to buy it for their own animals so that they will not suffer. And he says, my yoke is easy. He remembers what he learnt there. That moment, though, when our Lord is lost and found in the temple at 12 years old, is the last moment in the Gospels when we hear anything about St. Joseph. We have never heard him speak. And from that moment, he retreats into silence. That tells us something about him. He is not somebody who pushes himself forward. He is rather somebody who fulfills his vocation and is content to let the light of Christ shine instead. He is somebody who points, who points us to Jesus, who shows us uh, where we ought to be looking. He is uh, like St. John the Baptist who says, I must decrease and he must increase. Joseph, the silent but just figure in the Gospels, is one who shows that with supreme merit. And yet there is something else that we can know about St. Joseph. We can assume, since we don't hear of him later on, and our Lord in his public ministry is referred to as the son of Mary, that Joseph must have died at some point between when Jesus was 12 years old and when he's 30 years old. We don't know exactly when. But one thing we can know is that when St. Joseph died, when he finished this earthly life, he must have done so in the presence of Mary and in the presence of Jesus. And it's for this reason that we call St. Joseph the patron of the dying, that he is the hope of those who die, and that we invoke him at the moment of death as one who is the terror of demons, as one who gives us confidence and hope to place ourselves unreservedly into the hands of God and to look beyond death as uh, something which is not the final word in our own lives. St. Joseph, because his own death was one which we hope to emulate, uh, gives us hope because we too can die in the arms of Jesus and Mary invoking St. Joseph. Joseph then 
as he has come to add devotion paid to him in the last centuries of the church's life, is somebody who can teach us much, who can teach us to place our trust not in ourselves, but in the Lord, who can teach us to show trust in him. How difficult it must have been for Joseph to know that God would fulfill his promises. And yet think of what happened when the angel left him in that dream. Immediately we're told that he takes Mary to be his wife that he believes and carries out the angel's message, and then he goes on to give Jesus his name. If we imitate St. Joseph by naming Jesus in our own lives, by making him the center of our own lives, by realizing that death for us as Christians is not the end, not something that we need fear, but rather the gateway for us of eternal life, then St. Joseph can be for us a companion on our journey, a sign for us of hope. And together with his Immaculate Wife, Our Lady, and together with his Divine Son, Jesus Our Lord, we can uh, look at the next life and move forward through this life with confidence, with hope, and with trust. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. St. Joseph, patron of the di uh, dying and guardian of the universal church, pray for us. And may God bless every one of you. I pray God's blessing on and Shalom TV and the work that you do in, in proclaiming the good news of plentiful redemption through the, the, the media. And pray God's blessing also on the audiences, those who, who listen to and, and, and watch your programs. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>